Hello, welcome to the second installment of Masterpiece Mondays. I am Sarah Titus, and today I will discuss the imagery on a Greek black figure pot painted by Exekius. Before I discuss this particular pot, though, I want to address the importance of vase painting to our overall study and understanding of the entire genre of ancient Greek painting, of which vase painting is only one type. So when we talk about Greek painting, we really need to recognize all the types, though. Um, obviously, this first type is vase painting. Um, and we discuss this most frequently, mostly because uh, a lot of it survives from various contexts around the ancient Mediterranean world. Um, everything from Egypt to Italy um, to North Africa, from tombs and domestic spaces as well. Um, this tells us that Greek pottery was a prized commodity, even considered a luxury good. Um, a second type of Greek painting is painted sculpture. The pristine white marble sculptures, whether freestanding in the round or architectural sculptures, which have become so emblematic of ancient Greek culture were in fact quite colorful. Some might even say garishly so. So imagine a brightly colored Parthenon on the Acropolis in Athens. Traces of this pigment does survive um, and can be reconstructed through the use of raking UV light. A third category of Greek painting um, is monumental wall painting. This survives only sparingly and largely um, from funerary context, uh, tomb walls, uh, in particular Hellenistic tombs. Um, what we do see from that painting though is an incredibly um, uh, refined understanding of space, of shading, and of highlighting. Um, and then the final category is wood panel painting, which of course because of the medium no longer survives. Um, however, we're able to reconstruct the appearance and significance of the lost works of monumental wall and panel painting through their descriptions in ancient literary works and copies or adaptations or imitations made in other media and in particular made in vase painting. So while the terracotta objects and even the imagery on them may seem sometimes quotidian in nature, uh, I cannot emphasize enough how much information these types of pots yield about various and even intangible aspects of Greek culture and society. So turning now to uh, this pot by Ezekias, this is what's called an amphora that refers to the shape of the pot. Um, amphorae in the plural are characterized by an elevated foot, that is the part here at the bottom, um, a more rotund body, an elongated and narrower neck um, with two handles that generally um, uh, come from the neck onto the body, obviously for, for transport. Um, amphorae were used as storage vessels for liquids, which explains why the body is more round and the neck is more narrow. Of course, if it tips over, um, this type of construction would limit the spillage. Um, so what kinds of liquids were stored in here? Things like olive oil and wine. Um, they could also be used to um, store solids like grain. Um, there are various types of amphorae. Um, this one is about two feet tall, so it's pretty big. Um, but there are others that are even larger that were used for transporting goods um, by, by sea. Um, and they're even larger. So an amphora like this one um, would have been a prized possession for its owner due to the exceptional quality of the decoration um, and of the pot itself, um, and would likely have been a focal point of one of the cornerstones of ancient Greek society, which is the symposium. Um, the symposium was in effect a drinking party hosted in the homes of elite men. At these gatherings, participants would discuss philosophy, they would recite poetry, they would listen to music and play music, they would ponder the relationships of the gods and of course play drinking games. Um, so imagine this pot displayed prominently at the symposium as a sort of conversation starter. The revelers would be familiar with the imagery so they could discuss the subject matter as well as the skill of the famous painter Ezekias's decoration. And we know that this pot was painted by Ezekias because he signed it. Um, and it actually is signed in Greek and it says Ezekias made me. So it's a pretty, pretty good indicator. Um, one other thing to note here is that just because Ezekias was the painter, it doesn't necessarily mean he was the potter. Um, sometimes you see the same person um, as the potter and as the painter, um, but oftentimes these were two different tasks that required obviously different skill as today. Um, you know, not all painters are potters and likewise not all potters are painters. Um, and also this is, um, you know, not all pots are attributed to a particular painter and or potter because not all of them are signed. Um, 
Okay, so um, in addition to discussing the subject matter, viewers and revelers um, could also debate the merits of this type of decoration, which is called black figure. Um, black figure developed in Corinth during the Orientalizing period, which is you know in about the seventh century BCE. Um, it was the primary mode of vessel painting until 530 BCE, which is a very specific date, when painters began to switch to a new technique called the red figure technique. Um, in the black figure style, the painter applies pigment to the surface of the pot to create the figures before firing. The details, rather than modeled with contour lines, instead are incised with a stylus. So you get incredible patterns like what you see here on the cloaks of Achilles and of Ajax. Um, with this method, the figures remain black while the background, the ground of the pot, retains the reddish color of the clay. So what you see is black, that is pigment, and then this reddish background the, is the color of the terracotta. So the background is reserved, okay? Um, Exekius was well known for his black figure compositions like this one um, that displays, as I mentioned, the Greek uh, hero Achilles, or the, the prize warrior on the Greek side, um, playing the second best warrior, Ajax. So right here on the left, we have Achilles. On the right, we have Ajax. Obviously, Achilles is distinguished by um, this incredible crested helmet that he's wearing. But also, another hallmark of a lot of Greek pots is the fact that they kind of speak to us through um, what we call dipinti, which are um, essentially like um, inscriptions on here, right, that identify characters. Um, some painters identify minutia, right? Like they'll say something like, this is a spear, or these are greaves, or this is a table. Um, but in this case, they are, the figures are labeled Achilles and Ajax. Um, okay. Uh, they are seated um, in Achilles tent um, during the Trojan War, this conflict between obviously um, the Mycenaean Greeks uh, and the Trojans, um, which began over a woman, Helen of Troy, when Paris, the Trojan prince, stole Helen from her husband um, and took her to Troy. Um, and of course, she is, um, you know, known as the most beautiful woman in the world. And of course, her beauty is what, um, according to mythology, began this decade long war um, between these two sides. So what we see here is sort of a, um, a moment of lull in the fighting where these two warriors who had sort of a little bit of a rivalry, even though they were on the same side, um, being sort of the best and the second best um, on the Greek side, um, they take a moment out from the fighting um, to engage in some fun, right? Or at least a contest, and that is a game of dice. Um, so uh, their military prowess is obviously uh, hinted at. Uh, Achilles, as I mentioned, is wearing his helmet. Um, they're still wearing greaves and things like that. Um, but then, of course, they are holding their spears. Um, and then it's hard to see in this um, image, this re reproduction, but I think on the larger pot, you can see it, their armor, um, their shields are actually leaning up, up against what we could imagine as um, the walls of the tent. So of course, while this may be a moment of calm, um, ultimately they're in the middle of a um, long battle, which ultimately, as we know, um, the Greeks do win. Um, so the tension of the scene is emphasized through their bodies. Both of them lean forward, right, um, to focus our attention on what's happening right here. Their arms are outstretched and point onto the table, right? Their spears, um, they essentially come together right here in this inverted triangle, which is an inherently unstable kind of composition. Um, and out of their mouths, you can see this, um, they call their roles, okay? Um, so Achilles, he rolls a tessera, a four, um, whereas Ajax rolls a tria, three. So while we're led to believe here um, that Achilles is winning, right? Um, Exekius really relies on the viewer's knowledge and understanding of this particular situation um, to know that in fact, neither 
is winning. Neither can avoid their fate, right? Dice is a game of chance, okay? Um, and ultimately, both of their fate is an untimely death, right? Achilles at the hands of the Trojan prince Paris, um, and unfortunately, Ajax by suicide at his own hand after he is overlooked for Achilles' armor once uh, Achilles is um, dies in battle, um, the second best would receive um, the armor of um, the deceased, his deceased colleague. Um, and Ajax is overlooked and Achilles' armor is given to Odysseus. And this was seen as an incredible slight um, for which um, Ajax uh, felt incredibly dishonored. And the only appropriate response then was to take his own life. So unfortunately, what this foreshadows um, and what the psychology of this scene shows is um, sort of the fate of Achilles and the fate of Ajax. Um, and it is transposed onto to um, this game of dice. So one of the things that Ezekius is tremendously well known for is um, identifying one moment in a narrative um, that is the most sort of psychologically charged that can um, evoke an immediate emotional reaction from the viewer pathos. And in this case, um, this particular scene is very interesting because it is actually not referenced in any um, Greek text that we have. Um, so this isn't entirely a product of Ezekiel's imagination, but nevertheless, it becomes one of the most replicated scenes in um, Greek vase painting. And it even um, is replicated uh, just a few years later um, by a red finger painter named Endocrates, um, where he has a black figure representation of it on one side of the pot and a red figure representation on the other side of the pot. And the red figure is this new technique where the figures remain the color of the clay and everything else is painted in with pigment. And it um, the figures become much more um, much more enfleshed. Um, they look less static. Um, and it's just, it's a sort of a benefit of this new technique. Um, so I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about black figure um, and about Ezekius as well as vase painting and even a little bit about the symposium. Um, I look forward to next week. And again, please, um, I would love to hear your requests. Um, you can email them to me at cccmasterpiecemondays at gmail.com or reply to this post on Facebook. Thank you.